All right, uh, welcome back. Let me do a real quick test here, make sure everything looks good. There we go. Yeah. Pen is working. Good. All right, so um, I don't know if this is much of a RS Logics 5000 uh, lecture as it is just a general input output uh, and and basic applications of PLCs. Um, for your liking here. So again, my name is EJ Daigle, Dean of Robotics and Manufacturing here at Dunwoody College, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so when it comes to PLC inputs and outputs, hopefully you've watched some of my other videos by this point, and, and you're at least familiar with an input and an output is. Obviously, uh, a field device connected to uh, PLC as an input helps the PLC to make decisions. Um, the, the most basic uh, example I'd like to give would be if you uh, pull up your car to a to a red light at a traffic traffic intersection. Um, the the light would stay depending on the the traffic patterns. The light may stay red forever if the traffic light didn't know you were there. Um, but because we have loop detectors in the pavements, um, these are in the pavement. We have uh, inputs back to a controller. Uh, that controller knows that you're sitting and waiting. Um, and by sitting and waiting, it starts the uh, the events to eventually change the light. Um, from green to red on the opposing intersections or the uh, perpendicular intersections and then eventually give you a green um, in the direction that you're driving. Um, so examples like that, you know, these would be things that we call digital inputs. So things like switches um, are great examples of digital inputs. Um, push buttons are good examples of, of digital inputs. Um, but, you know, most everything we're thinking of when we think digital, you know, we think Digital means on or off. We only have two states, one or zero. We'll also see the term discrete used quite a bit in place of the word digital, and that uh, basically means the same thing. But when we think of on or off things, you know, it's not just a, a switch like you might think of, like a you know, a switch like a wall switch to control a lamp or something like that. But it's also things like float switches. Um, you know, floats. Uh, Float switches measure uh, liquid levels. Uh, flow switches measure things that are flowing through, let's say, a pipe, you know, um, things like that. Um, pressure switches would be another great, great example. Uh, pressure switches are going to tell me when, when the pressure in a tank reaches a certain level or something like that. Um, I'll, maybe I'll try to get four or five different things for each one of these columns rather than spending all day on this slide. Um, but if if you can measure something we can probably also trigger a switch based upon it as well you know you could think of a foot switch you know your car is more of an analog foot switch um but you could also have a foot switch that's on or off as well right um digital outputs the digital outputs are the things that uh basically the plc is going to turn on and off with respect to the to the inputs so that loop detector in the pavement for the traffic signal light um that's going to trigger a lamp, right? Hopefully it's going to trigger a green lamp versus a red lamp so you can you can move through the traffic intersection. Um, but other things that we can turn on, we can turn a motor. And when I talk about a motor now, I'm talking about digital. I'm just talking about the ability to turn on or off. So if it's hooked up to a motor starter and it just turns on or off, it's a digital output. Um, I could turn on a fan. I could turn on a buzzer. I could turn on a maybe a bell, I could, you know, motors could be hooked up to all kinds of things like conveyor belts, you know, um, any of these things we would, we would consider a, uh, a digital output. Now when it gets to analog, you know, all this stuff over here was on or off, right? When we say digital, we're talking on or off. When we talk about analog for these two sections here, here and here, we're typically talking about a zero to 10 volt signal, a four to 20 milliamp signal, or you can also do a negative 10 volt to positive 10 volt signal. And what that means is an analog input is going to get a signal. I'll just use this one as my example of zero to 10 volts. And then the PLC can make a decision based upon that range. So if it's at 50%, I might do this. If it's at 75%, I might do that. And if it's at 100%, I might do that. You know, think about the, the volume on your stereo. You know, you can turn the volume in your stereo between zero and 10, and 10 is very loud and zero is dead silent, right? Um, and one is fairly quiet. So an analog input could be something like a potentiometer. 
Um, think of a potentiometer kind of like a a dimmer switch in your in your living room or something like that where we can control the lamp level. We're not just turning it on or off at that point. Other analog inputs could be something like, again, almost like a foot switch here, uh, where a foot switch, uh, foot control, I would call it instead. And a foot control varies between zero and 10 volts instead of just being on or off. Um, other analog inputs, are, you're fine. Other analog inputs would be things like uh, a temperature sensor. So a temperature switch could be under the, the digital side of this. Uh, temperature sensor would be uh, something that reads zero to 10 volts. So maybe at zero degrees Celsius, I read zero volts and at 10, 100 degrees Celsius, I read uh, 10 volts. So think, so that's, that's the interesting thing. A lot of times a digital input and, a di and an analog input can be measuring the same value, but a temperature switch would say, okay, if the temperature ever gets up to 90 degrees C, turn on. Once it's below 90 degrees C, turn off. You might think of like the, uh, you know, uh, a thermostat switch in your, in your car engine or something, you know, where it's going to open up. And actually, even those, they tend to be more analog. They'll, they'll open up a little bit as, as temperature rises. Sensor though, means that we, uh, we're going to control this thing completely, you know, analog. Uh, you know, you could also have a flow sensor. Almost anything that I write uh, in this region here, I could also write for analog. So I could have a pressure sensor. And what is the difference again? The difference is I get up to a certain pressure. I turn on in this case. And in this case, you know, maybe zero to 100 PSI corresponds to zero to 10 volts. So I can measure the pressure versus just uh, measuring when it's at a certain level and clicking on and clicking off. Analog outputs. Um, these are going to be the things that we, we're going to drive based upon an analog input. Um, you could think of something like a speed controller. Um, uh, you could think of something like a, uh, a, a proportional controller. This actually could be a speed controller. We call it PropCon. But a proportional controller accepts a, let's say, a 0 to 10 volt input, and then it controls the speed of a fan or the speed of a motor or, or uh, the temperature of a heater or something like that. So you could say a heater controller, heat controller. Probably don't need to put that, uh, I'll put an R on it. A heater controller, you know, VFD, a variable frequency drive. A variable frequency drive can get a 0 to 10 volt signal coming in, and then that's going to be proportional to the, the frequency it's going to send out to a motor to control motor speed. You know, so we might, and I might actually just list a few of these things. You know, motor speed is something that we, uh, we would consider an analog output. Uh, how about, uh, you know, fan speed, you know, position, you know, something that's not just truly on or off is going to be something that we would consider an analog output. Oop. Slide's not going to the next one here. Uh, let's see here. I'll go next. This should get me there. There we go. Um, some of the electrical symbols. So as you start to look at prints and things, you're going to see a lot of different electrical symbols um, that correspond to many of these these devices that we're that we're talking about here. Um, so I just want to go over a few of these. If you go to industrialtext.com, industrialtext.com, they have a, a a link on industrialtext.com called Free Stuff. I really like this website, and I'll give those guys props for putting this together. Um, by all means, visit their site. But under the Free Stuff, you can get free I.O. listing sheets, program listing sheets, and you can also get a link to the uh, process electrical symbols, you know, PNID uh, symbols. So it gives you a list. I'm only going through, I think I got 14 of them here. Um, but on that, that list that they've got on the Industrial Text website, uh, there might be as many as you know a hundred or more um, on that that link. So check that out and take a look at that. I would tell you for what we do in the lab, um, this is going to be the bulk of it. Uh, so so let's go over these first. Um, this guy here, this is a three phase motor. So that's a that's a good one to know. Um, you guys have seen that in some of your prints thus far. Uh, this will be an earth ground. And earth ground means something that is connected into the earth. So this is typically 
uh, you know, some sort of safety circuit. Uh, and, and typically it corresponds, the reason why it's drawn like this is this is the, the ground at the side of a building. And this is a metal stake driven into that. Um, so all of the grounds in the building are attached back to that metal stake. Um, this is a foot switch. This is a disconnect. So when you think of a disconnect, you think about um, you know lockout tag out. So there's a way that I can remove power from the system and then I can lock it out. So this kind of corresponds to the handle on the disconnect. And when I flip that handle, all these, these three phases close. Um, this is a limit switch. And let me, let me bring something up now that I look at this. We also can, can determine the, the position of a switch. So like right now, as I look at this, this is a normally open limit switch. It's drawn in its de-energized state and it's shown open. It's a normally open limit switch. You might look at this and say, well, this would appear to be a normally closed limit switch because it's drawn in its de-energized state. Um, I normally would like to see this drawn underneath because it looks to me like I have to press this thing through that pole, but, but it is shown its de-energized state, a normally closed foot switch, a normally open limit switch. This would be a solenoid. Oops, solenoid. Um, you may also call it a coil. Um, that could be a, a coil on a, uh, on a pneumatic solenoid to, uh, to route air in a certain direction. It could also be the coil of a relay. Um, you'll see many relays drawn with this, with this symbol as well. Um, you know, solenoid or a coil. Um, this is a push button. And as you look at this push button, we can see it's drawn in its closed state. So it's normally closed. Um, this one's kind of a funky one. You don't see it all the time. This is a bell. It kind of looks like it's got a little, you know, round part on the top. And uh, there's another one you'll see occasionally, probably more often in, in our neck of the woods, is a buzzer. So it's also drawn with the square on the bottom, but it's got this little flapper piece. Um, and so you got a buzzer and you got a bell. This is a flow switch. I always say, and this is this would be a normally open flow switch drawn in its normally open state. I always think about this little flag like a, like a rudder, like it's sitting, in a, it's sitting in a pipe. And then as something flows through that pipe, that little rudder gets pushed up and hits the contact. So that's, that's just the way I think about it to remember them. This is what we call a pressure switch. I don't have a, a good way to kind of cheat to remember that. It is kind of like a little, little round, kind of like a P. Maybe you can think of it like, but it's a pressure switch, normally open. And this one's one of the most common ones you'll see. This is a float switch. And again, this will be a normally open. We'll use this one here in a few minutes and talk about this one a little bit more. This one here is a temperature switch. Another important one to, to note. And this one will be normally closed. You can see it's drawn, you know, connected to these two poles, right? It's already touching here. It's already touching here, so it's normally closed versus you can see this one's drawn open. It's touching here, but it's not touching here, so it's normally open. This is what we call a chassis ground. And what that really means is um, for safety purposes, a lot of the, the things that are zero volt or grounded are gonna connect to the chassis. And then eventually that chassis ground may or may not connect back to earth ground. Uh, maybe floating at some point, which brings up another another symbol, actually. This would be a floating ground. So since we've got, you know, time to show you a couple more here. And then this would be, uh, this is also a temperature switch, but look at this guy here. Compared to the one we just did above, this one is actually normally open. So we've got a normally open and normally closed temperature switch. And the way I would think about that is, Let's say each one of these temperature switches were set at 100 degrees, right? What's going to happen is at 100, greater than or equal to 100 degrees, this one's going to close. And at greater than or equal to 100 degrees, this one's going to open. So that gives you an idea of what's going to happen with these switches. And I don't know why my computer's giving me a hard time there. So I'll just right click and go next. That'll work. Um, tank filling application. So this is what I really want to get at with the heart of this. You guys will start to see this in some of your homework and some of your worksheets. Um, we've actually already started to see it a little bit. And I, I really wanna make sure we've nailed this thing down. Um, if I'm looking at a float switch, you can see the float on here. See the float on here. A normally closed float switch is already making contact. And what's gonna happen is, this is in a tank. The tank level will start to rise, right? If this is like a liquid in the tank, right? 
as that liquid starts to rise, what's going to happen with a normally closed? What's going to happen with a normally closed is this, this float is going to push it up and it's going to open the circuit. So a normally closed float switch will be closed when not actuated. And then when it gets actuated, it'll be open. Think about the tank in your, in your, uh, uh, you know, in your toilet tank. There's a float switch in there and you can see the float go up and eventually shut the valve. So an interesting thing about that then, do you call that normally closed or normally open? Um, well, it's a mechanical switch, so it's a little bit different. I, I might call it normally open and then when it closes, it actually closes the valve, right? Um, so so kind of like this guy here, you know, here's the toilet tank level, right? Um, and eventually the tank level is going to keep coming up, keep coming up, and eventually this switch is going to close right here. So this one's a normally open float switch. And then they do have float switches out there that are what we call double throw. So single pull, so just one pull on this side, but two places to throw. Um, so a single pull double throw will have both a normally open contact and a normally closed contact. And it'll typically be drawn like this, shown in its normally closed state, but showing that I have two different states for that float switch. Oh, forgot I gotta click this again. Here we go, next. All right, tank filling application. So what we're going to do is we're going to simulate this tank filling application. And I will tell you, we're, uh, uh, we're probably not going to take on the whole thing at once. I'll let you guys in the lab or something take on the whole thing. But, but let's just look at what this thing says. So we've got a, a pipe up here that has liquid. All right, and it's under pressure. We've got some sort of pressure of liquid sitting here. And we've got these valves. This is the symbol for a valve. So this is a valve. This is a valve and this is a valve and we'll assume that these valves uh maybe they're 24 volt dc and if i send a 24 volt dc signal to y1 it opens up and when it opens up it starts filling the tank here right it starts filling the tank up now I, i'm going to kind of eliminate these other ones for right now we're just going to look at it from the, the perspective of the one tank here so what's going to trigger it well i can see down here i've got a couple of switches these are float switches um and I'm gonna assume that these are being actuated or not actuated right now, meaning the tank level is right here. You can see the tank levels up to here, right? Um, so we're gonna call this guy a normally closed float switch, but he's being held open right now. He's being held open by the process variable. So right now, the tank level is somewhere in the middle. Um, this float switch is being held open. Now this float switch up here, is, the tank level's below it, so it's going to be a normally open float switch that is in its normal position right now. It's not being held anywhere because the tank, the, the process variable, the water or the liquid is not pressing on that float at all. What's going to happen is eventually this tank, you know, we're using up this liquid for a process of some sort. The tank level is going to come down. If you see this float here, how it's connected to this float switch, you know, imagine a pole here and imagine a pole there. What's going to happen is eventually this float is going to fall down this way and the switch is going to close. Oops. So it's going to close in that direction. That's going to tell me when the tank is empty. And once the tank empties out, then I want to open up the valve and then I want to start filling the tank again. Well, when do I stop filling? Well, eventually that this, as I'm filling, this switch is going to open up again, but I want to keep filling. I keep filling. I keep filling, I keep filling, and eventually the tank level is going to get high enough that it's going to press on this float and close that switch. So switch two, as I look at this, switch two is going to essentially, oops, is going to open Y1. So switch two is going to open Y1 to start the fill, right? And then switch one is going to close Y1, which is going to stop the fill. And you get an idea of what those two switches are doing. Now, what are we going to do to make this thing work, right? Well, step one, we're going to create an IO listing sheet. We got to know how these switches work, understand how they work, and then create the wiring diagram. That's really what the IO listing sheet is. This is our wiring diagram, okay? Step two, we're going to do a program listing sheet. Um, and so in the program listing sheet, we're going to uh, actually map out what our program is going to look like. I always recommend 
doing a program listing sheet first. Um, I would tell you step two, in my mind, step two is more important than step three, which is actually hooking up and, and programming the PLC. Um, and step four, which is very important, is testing and debugging and, and making sure we're going to work. So I think we'll probably stop right now at step two, uh, just because I want to go through these two steps uh, in pretty good detail here. Uh, oh, got to click here again. Next. All right, so here's our IO listing sheet. I, I took and made a map of just one of the one of the tanks here so we can really look at it. System ID, I'm going to give this guy, I'm going to call this guy my uh, tank fill. That's going to be my system ID. The designer, I'll put my last name. You can put your last name if you're doing this or following along. Today's date, which I got my watch on here, is 4-6-2019. And we'll call this sheet 101. Um, and there may be multiple sheets depending on, you know, if you have to route 120. Um, on my recommendation is you use a different sheet for each voltage level. So like on this case, this is going to be my 24 volt DC and my zero volt return. Um, and so now we've only got three IO points. So I've got to figure out what am I going to do with this guy? Well, so uh, if I was going to wire up these IO devices, I'm going to start with the the switch two, I guess. I mean, I could. It doesn't really matter. I could start with switch one. So I see switch one was a normally open float switch. So I'm going to call this. Uh, uh, let's call it S1, FS, NO. So someone looking at this can say, okay, I see what's going on. That's a normally open float switch. So we're going to draw it as a normally open. We're going to make it look just like the drawing. We're going to go like this like this and we're going to put a float on it like that all right so there's my normally open float switch he's all going to be wired in now i could hand this to somebody and they should be able to figure out how to wire that up and make it work um now i'm going to look at my plc my plc screw terminal has a screw terminal called uh in zero i'm going to hook it up to in one just to just to eliminate any confusion the screw terminal i'm going to use is in one so then switch one goes to in one. The next one is a normally closed float switch. So we'll draw him over to here and we'll draw him like this. So he's actually making contact right now. And we'll go over like this. And we'll call him in two. So he lines up nicely with S2 which we know is a float switch, and we know that that guy is a normally close. So I'm really giving somebody a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of ways to tell what's going on here, right? Um, from the symbols, I can see this float switch is normally open, this float switch is normally closed. I also have NO and NC over here, so somebody can tell, tell exactly what's going on. Now, as I look at my DC input module, I see I do need a DC common for those two guys. So I'm gonna wire him up. I'm gonna call this guy here. DC com. Oops. Let me see if I can erase that real quick. Uh, pointer options. Go to my eraser here. There we go. And I'll go to my pen. So DC common. And that's going to wire up. So this is the, the input module common. If you remember, you do need to have, um, there needs to be a complete path for current. So if there, so to make the PLC, for the input module to see this signal, uh, 24 volts, when this switch gets actuated, it turns on this input, but there has to be a return path for that as well. Now this, this Y1 valve, um, typically that's going to be controlled by some sort of solenoid or some sort of signal. Um, but this is going to be an output right now, right? Where both of the, this was a normally closed. These were inputs down here. This guy up here is going to be an output. And what we'll say is we'll say that there's a, uh, there's some sort of solenoid hooked up to this guy. So if you turn that solenoid on, he opens. And if you turn the solenoid off, he closes is what we'll say. Um, and we'll say it's a 24 volt solenoid too, just to make our, so we don't have to fill out another sheet here. As I look at my DC output module, I see I have a common for my DC output module now. So I'm going to call this common exactly what it's listed on the, uh, on the, uh, the module 
itself, it says plus VDC. So I'm gonna go down a little ways just to keep these separate if I need to add something later on. So it's listed as plus VDC. So if this was the input module common, this is gonna be the output module supply. So we'll call this output, output module supply. Oh, I hate when I get messy here. So I'm gonna change that pointer option here to an eraser and go back to my pen. Still getting the trick of this uh, this little tablet here. So this will be output module supply. All right, then next, we wanna turn on that solenoid. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw in an output screw terminal. And we call them Y1. I'm gonna go ahead and hook them up to, to out one just to keep things straight, straight here. I'm gonna call this out one. I could use out zero by the way, but I'm not going to. And um, we're gonna use a solenoid. So I'm gonna draw this as a solenoid. So I'm gonna draw it with this little thing like this. And we're gonna call it, uh, it's a little two position solenoid. So this will be my, my valve solenoid. And uh, you know, I'll just, the two P means, um, essentially what it means is gonna mean on is gonna be uh, open the valve. So I'm gonna try to give as much information as I can to who's ever wiring this up so they can understand what, what is it that he's up to here. Um, if, the, if the solenoid, uh, if the valve solenoid is on, valve open, and if the solenoid valve is off, the valve is closed. All of this is gonna be determined by the valve itself. So I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not looking at a valve right now, so we're just simulating this a little bit to see how it would work. So we've got our, our, our solenoid out, our Y1. I should call this Y1, valve Y1 solenoid. On equals valve open, off equals valve closed. And then I've got inputs one and two, which are gonna be switch one and switch two. Now, the nice thing about this is, this is my wiring diagram. This is, this is what somebody can go ahead and uh, start wiring up the circuit, and make it all functional for me. And I know, you know, when I, when I start programming, I'm gonna program with these inputs in mind and these outputs in mind. And if I was doing three tanks, it'd have to be multiplied by three as, as far as what we've got here. Um, so we'd be using, you know, inputs three and four, five and six, and outputs one, two, and three. Um, but now I can start programming off of that. And I know when I hand this to an electrician or a panel builder, I can say, here's how I want it wired up. I know it's gonna come back and it's gonna line up with the code that I'm writing right now. So we'll go to next. And now here's my program listing sheet. I'm gonna list it the same exact title, tank fill, or tank, I think I called it tank filling, didn't I? No, it's fine, tank fill's fine. And the designer again is me. Now this is a different sheet, right? This is not the same sheet. Um, so it's still sheet 101 because this is a program listing sheet. This is not an IO listing sheet. This is gonna tell us how the code is gonna work. I always recommend, I actually on my desk, I have a stack of these um, printed out. I got a three ring binder with them. And, and at one point I had even taken a stack of them and ran them to a print shop and had them uh, you know, put the little glue on the top so you could just tear them off page by page, kind of like a, like a, I don't know, like a, like a notebook. Um, and that, that was really handy. I, I highly recommend doing that. If you're a programmer, the reason, the reason why is, you know, mind you in my slide, I've only got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 rungs available to me, but on a single sheet, if this was sitting in front of me, I think it's about 18 or 20 rungs you can look at at a time. Um, versus if you're programming the software, you kind of get tunnel vision um, because you're really magnified in about two or three or maybe four rungs if you're lucky. So you can't see everything that's going on. So in this case, I'm gonna call this rung number one. And what I wanna do is um, I wanna use, you know, switch one and switch two to tell me when to open valve Y1, right? Um, and let's see here, let's go ahead and start this thing. So when switch, two closes right now it's held open because the tank level is where it is but when switch two closes that's what needs to start my fill so let me go over here and go uh i'm just going to call it like this i'm going to call it s2 
So in S2, if I put it as examine if closed, so when it closes, or normally open contact, when it closes, that's when I want to open Y1. This is actually a fairly simple program now that I look at this, right? And I will call this Y1 as my output, okay? Um, uh, Y1 opens when energized. So just trying to give myself some comments here that uh, makes sense. I got two I's in there. You guys are gonna get sick of me using this eraser. I'm just trying to get good at it so in the future it's a little little more seamless. Pointer options pen. When energized, there we go. Um, so switch two turns on, I energize Y1, that makes perfect sense. Now, as that tank starts coming up though, right? The, the switch closed when it fell down here, right? But now as the tank starts coming up, isn't the switch gonna open again? So if all I had was S2 on Y1, I would only maintain the level right at the point where the switch closes, right? And that's not real handy. I need to keep that, that valve, that Y1 valve open, right? Until switch one closes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a holding contact in here. I'm gonna put a holding contact of Y1. Y1 is gonna hold itself. So I could just put it in here. Um, but Y1 is going to hold itself uh, open or energized until what happens? Well, until S1 closes. So S2 closing, this one closing down here, when the tank level fell and this one closed, that's what actually got me. Let me erase this real quick so we can see it better here. Uh -uh, there we go. So what you can see down here, is when at, when the tank level fell, 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 switch two, the float actually went this way and actually closed that switch. That then caused Y1 to energize opening the valve. Now we need to have Y1 stay open until this tank level gets high enough that it's actually gonna press on this float and close S1. So if S1 closes so i need to have a break of that so until s1 closes so it's going to look something like this so let's look at this uh tank level falls when the tank level falls s2 is going to close right right now it's normally closed switch being held open by the process variable when it gets down far enough it's going to close um, that s2 closing is going to cause me to energize y1 Energizing Y1 is going to close my holding circuit. Now, mind you, S1, we're way down here right now, right? Right? We're actually beneath that float. Um, as I start filling, S1 is still open right now. Um, eventually, though, the tank level is going to get high enough that it's going to press on this float and close S1. And by closing S1, we energize the S1 input screw terminal, reversing the state, essentially opening the fill valve and this should take care of me and if you needed to replicate this for y2 well, i'd be as simple as going to rung two you'd have to find out what that next switch is you know what this uh i'm, I'm assuming this is a y2 right there'd be another float switch up here and you'd have a y2 right here right so you could replicate this very easily um, to make this work and i would guess if we looked at it, it's probably s4 and S3, they probably kept the same, the same terminology here. So a second tank, Y2 opens, went on, right? And you could do a third tank and a fourth tank and whatever you need. Then I would challenge you, you know, if you go back here a little ways, I would then challenge you and say, okay, what if I wanted to fill these in the order that they were emptied? Um, not going to go there quite yet. I'll wrap this video up for today. But what if they emptied three, one, two? How could I make it so that this one would fill from empty to full, and then this one would fill from empty to full, then this one would empty to fill from empty to full? So I'd only be allowed to fill one tank at a time, but they would fill in the order in which they would empty. Um, so that 
that would be the next challenge for you guys to start thinking about as you're uh, as you're thinking about this whole uh, you know kind of process control type work that we're talking about here. So that's it for this lesson. Uh, thank you for your time, and we'll see you next time.